It gets dark and the ship takes on a heavy list. An alarm starts and all passengers are told to head for the lifeboats. You praise yourself for not having gone to bed. From the bar, it's close to the boat deck where the lifeboats are located. When you reach the deck, you see how the lifeboats fill up quickly. The heavy list only allows for the loading of lifeboats on one side of the ship. It's dark out and big waves are breaking against the ship's hull. The water is freezing. You estimate that the ship will sink in just a few minutes. A crew member announces that only one more lifeboat will be lowered. Luckily, you find yourself standing next to it. Behind you, men and women, boys and girls are striving to reach the lifeboat. What would you do? The situation I just described is indeed terrifying and extreme. You're under enormous stress and the risk of dying is imminent. As an economist, I tend to portray people as a homo economicus, a rational individual consistently maximizing his best interests, even if that comes at the expense of others. According to this theory, most of us will find it rational to save ourselves in a shipwreck, rather than helping those around. It's not even clear whether those who are helped will survive in the end. While the Homo economicus model has proven useful in many situations, we have learned that norms of altruism, fairness and morality govern our behavior towards others in daily life. We are expected to be generous and make sacrifices to help those who are more vulnerable, even if it contrasts with our best self-interest. Consistent with this, we observe that people donate blood and organs without being compensated, and that donations of money to charitable organizations is widespread. From reading history books, it becomes clear that the common belief is that there exists a norm in maritime disasters that women and children are to be saved first. Similarly, the captain and the crew are expected to rescue the passengers before they save themselves. Although no international maritime law has ever required that women and children are to be saved first, the practice has historically been referred to as the unwritten law of the sea, a law of human nature embodying chivalric ideals of protection of the weak, extravagant respect for women, and masculine courage. Historians point to the men's action on board the Birkenhead, a British ship which capsized outside the coast of South Africa in 1852 as the advent of the norm. The 500 or so British soldiers on board the ship did not panic or rush for the lifeboats. Instead, they helped the women and children. Narratives of the men's courage in the face of the hopeless circumstances on board Birkin have, have been widely spread in books, poetry and visual arts. According to the accounts, the men stood at attention as the ship went down. Though only less than one third of the ship's total were saved, all of the women and children were rescued. Sixty years later, a more famous British ship, the Titanic, sank in the North Atlantic Ocean, along with two-thirds of its passengers and crew. The, the Titanic disaster has come to serve uh, is one of the most extensively uh, covered events in history, and the evacuation has come to serve as the prime example of male chivalry at sea. Men stood back while women and children were given priority to the lifeboats. In the end, more than two-thirds of the women and half of the children were saved, compared with only a quarter of the men. The captain and most of the crew also followed procedures and remained on board the ship to the very end. That women and children had been saved at the expense of men during the loss of Titanic was central to almost all accounts of the disaster, and the newspapers became sites for discussion of character, masculinity, and male courage. Three days after the sinking, Daily Mail wrote that, without any distinction of rank, strength, or wealth, the men stood aside. There was no wild fight in which the stronger gained an ignorable victory. The ancient law of the sea, women and children first, was maintained with perfect courage by more than a thousand men. In the words of the Prime Minister, the best traditions of the sea were observed. While Birkenhead and Titanic are celebrated examples of what happens during maritime disasters, a closer look in the history books, however, reveals that there are shipwrecks that clearly lack examples of self-sacrifice and male heroism. In fact, only two years after the celebrated evacuation of Birkenhead, a more unlovely example occurred outside the coast of New Finland. The U.S. ship Arctic had collided with a French steamer in the fog, and though Arctic remained afloat for more than four hours, there was a general panic on board, and little regard was given to the captain's order that women and children were to be saved first. 
Of the 400 persons on board, only 86 survived. However, not a single one of them was a woman or a child. Another interesting historical account regards the British ship Jeddah in 1880. The ship had been damaged outside Yemen, and the captain believed it was doomed. However, instead of evacuating the ship, he abandoned it together with his crew and falsely reported the ship lost when they reached land. Jeddah was, however, towed safely into the port of Aden by a passing ship, and in fact, not a single one of the many men, women, and children on board the ship had perished. Examples such as Jeddah and Arctic suggest that Birkenhead and Titanic do not necessarily represent the long-standing tradition of putting women and children first, but are perhaps only celebrated exceptions. My colleague Michael Linder and I realized that maritime disasters provide a valuable context in which it's possible to empirically study how people behave in life and death situations, and in particular where the social norms of helping behavior are being upheld. Based on the statistics from the Titanic disaster, our hypothesis was that women survived to a larger extent than men in shipwrecks. If men comply with the norm of women and children first and give women priority to lifeboats, we should expect to see that women fare better than men. This was the case in the Birkenhead and Titanic disasters. However, the question is whether we should expect this to hold for shipwrecks in general. For reading shipwreck accounts, it becomes clear that success in evacuation of a sinking ship is typically determined by the ability to move fast through corridors and stairs, which is often made difficult by heavy list, congestion, and debris. Since men are physically stronger than women, we should expect them to fare better than women if they do not engage in self-sacrificing health and behavior. The fact that other important traits, such as aggressiveness, competitiveness, and swimming ability, are also more prevalent in men, further suggests that men should survive to a larger extent than women if they try to save themselves, rather than complying with the norm. Based on the statistics from Titanic, we also assumed that passengers should survive to a larger extent than the crew. According to maritime conventions, it is the duty of the crew, and in particular the captain, to conduct a safe evacuation of the ship. If the crew follow procedures and leave the ship after the passengers, we would expect them to fare worse than the passengers. However, crew members are commonly more familiar with the ship, often have emergency training, and are likely to receive early information about the severity of the situation. We would therefore expect crew members to fare better than passengers if they try to save themselves rather than assisting the passengers. After having framed our hypothesis, we just needed data to test them. A good thing with the shipping industry is that it keeps excellent records on the people on board their ships, even the ones that are wrecked. Thanks to amateur historians, many of these passengers and crew lists are publicly available in books or sometimes online. Besides collecting data from passenger and crew lists, we also spent a great number of hours reading accounts of the shipwrecks to learn more about the situational conditions. I should say that reading all the tragic stories about loss and fear had a profound impact on my life. While I'm used to be mentally involved in my research, this particular project was also very emotionally exhausting. I was deeply affected from reading the detailed descriptions about painful family tragedies and loss of young lives. The shipwreck narratives also hunted me in my dreams. I'm an occasional sleep talker. However, during the most intense phase of the project, I kept my spouse awake more or less every night with stories from the seas. I even answered her interested questions. One night, I was a captain aboard a wrecked schooner in the Baltic Sea conducting an orderly evacuation. Another night, I was a panicked passenger aboard a sinking emigrant ship off the coast of Canada. After several months of work collecting data and reading shipwrecks accounts, we had compiled that database with 18 of the most notable maritime disasters between 1852 and 2011, covering the fates of over 15,000 passengers and crew members of more than 30 different nationalities. So, what did these data tell us about male chivalry? Is the norm of women and children first typically upheld in maritime disasters? Let us first take a look at the familiar survival statistics from the Titanic disaster. In the graph, uh, you see the, the, the horizontal axis displays the categories of people on board the ship, whereas the vertical axis displays the survival rate in percent. Um, uh, consistent with what previous research has confirmed, we see that women and children survive to a much higher degree than men and, uh, and, and uh, crew members. 
the captain, Edward Smith, have a survival rate of zero because he went down with his ship. So what did the statistic for the other shipwrecks tell us? Are the survival patterns consistent with those for the Titanic? No. As you can see, the pattern is actually completely different. Uh, the average survival rates for these disasters shows that crew members fare best, followed by captains and male passengers, whereas women and children have the lowest survival rates. We see that women do actually only substantially worse than men, and that only a small fraction of the children survives. It is indeed obvious that those with most physically able and with the best knowledge about the ship survive to a much larger extent than the more vulnerable. And hence, that little regard seems to be given to the norm of women and children first in maritime disasters. We also analyzed the data from each shipwreck separately uh, using statistical methods. And these exercises revealed that women have a survival advantage over men in only two out of the 18 disasters. Guess which ones? Birkenhead and Titanic. However, the question remained, why do women survive to a larger extent than men on board Birkenhead and Titanic? What made this shipwreck special? One possible explanation is that both ships sank more than a century ago in a different time when the norm to save women and children may have been stronger. As society has become more equal, women have gained a stronger position which may have made them more capable to survive on their own without the assistance of men. Consistent with the story, we found that the difference in survival rates between the sexes has diminished over time, but that women still fare worse than men. Another explanation is that both Birkenhead and Titanic were British ships with mostly Britons on board. If the stigma of violating the norm is more severe for British men than for men of other nationalities, we would expect to see that women fare better on board British ships. Nevertheless, we found that women fare worse rather than better on board British ships, a finding that clearly contrasts with the notion of British men being more gallant than men of other nationalities. <laughs> a final explanation is that the survival rate of women increases relative to that of men when the captain prioritized them in the evacuation. Both on board Birkenhead and the Titanic, the captains ordered women and children first. On board Titanic, the men who disobeyed the order risked being shot. The order was enforced with a threat of violence also on board Birkenhead. In line with the conjecture, we found that the order is beneficial to women. This result interestingly suggests that it's the policy of the captain rather than the moral sentiments of men that determines whether women are given preferential treatment in shipwrecks. Oh, our research shows that Birkenhead and Titanic are, are exceptional in many ways, and that these disasters seem to have spurred misconceptions about human behavior in disasters. Rather than there being a norm of women and children first governing our actions in these kind of situations, behavior seems to be better captured by the expression, every man for himself. Although women and children first appears to be the exception rather than the rule, Discussions about the practice frequently appear in the public debate following crisis at sea. The most recent example is the sinking of the Italian, Italian cruise ship Costa Concordia in 2012, which killed 32 people. The response in the media following the disaster shows that the question of whether women and children should go first remains just as central today as it was a century ago when Titanic sank. Media focused on the lack of priority of women and children, and particularly emphasizing the lack of chivalry and professionalism shown by the captain and his crew. Narratives describe rough crew members who, instead of evacuating the ship, tried to save themselves and pushed women and children out of the way. The accounts regarding the captain's behavior are especially harsh. He was flirting with a woman rather than being at his post in the hours before the shipwreck. He also caused the disaster when he brought the ship too close to shore in an attempt to show off and perhaps most shameful in the eyes of the public, that he was basically the first one to escape the ship. The legal sentence for his misconduct was 16 years in jail, whereas the public's punishment of his violation of the norm was to dub him Captain Coward. However, in the light of the survival rates for captains I showed you earlier, Captain Coward's behavior actually seems to be quite normal. <laughs> Popular culture is also contributing to keeping the myth of women and children first alive. I'm a big fan of movie director James Cameron, and particularly his Academy Award-winning film about Titanic. 
During the making of Titanic, Mr. Cameron literally went to the bottom of things when he shot footage of the actual wreck. But not only was Mr. Cameron careful in getting the scenery authentic, he also gave a correct depiction of people's behavior during the disaster. Consistent with the historical accounts, the men in the movie remain stoic, while women and children are put into the lifeboats in an orderly manner. Also, the Lady and the Trump love story about Rich Rose and Poor Jack reflects the contemporary facts about behavior in disasters. Although Rose rescues Jack in one scene, he is the one saving her in the end by keeping the life raft afloat. However, as our knowledge about how people behave in disasters is updated, there have also been new ways of depicting this issue in the popular culture. In his movie, Tourist, who forced majority in English from 2014, director Ruben Östlund tells a story about a Swedish family on a skiing holiday in the French Alps. Ten minutes into the movie, a controlled avalanche goes wild and approaches the family as they're having lunch on the deck of a restaurant. In the heat of the moment, the husband and father, Thomas, panics and takes off with his ski gloves and cell phone, leaving his wife and children behind in a dense smoke of snow. However, it soon becomes apparent that the avalanche did not reach the restaurant. And as the waiter reassures the guests that it's safe, Thomas returns to his family, acting as if nothing awkward has happened. What then follows in the movie is a different kind of avalanche. Thomas' unlovely abandonment leads to the dramatic sinking of his marriage and of his entire being as a man. Many of us probably consider Thomas' behavior cowardly and shameful. However, the research I have presented suggests that a large fraction of us are actually likely to behave similar to him if we end up in a disaster. People often ask me whether it's safe to go on a cruise, and my answer is always yes. The sea is beautiful, and despite there being several incidents on board ships every year, only a handful turn into a mar maritime disaster. The survival rates in maritime disasters have also increased substantially over time, which is good. If I were to give you an advice before your departure, however, it will be that you should choose a cabin high up, close to the boat deck, on the starboard side. The majority of ships in our study sank port side down. <laughs> on board a ship, you should remain sober and be alert. And most importantly, you shouldn't ignore any alarms, because in the unlikely event of a disaster, you must make sure that you're the first one off the ship. Thank you for listening.